in order to motivate uh, some of today's uh, discussion, I want to point out that um, if you look carefully at most of the mainstream languages, they all derive from a mathematical model. So C comes from the von Neumann model of computation um, and um, Lisp and ML and uh, Haskell and Dylan and Scala and F sharp all come from the Lambda calculus. Um, uh, and we could we can trace the origin of every language back to some mathematical model of computation. And so understanding the maths um, behind uh, these different um, uh, these different languages is very important, especially if we want our um, programming to um, ultimately have some some good clean semantics in the sense that we know what our programs do. We know what they're what they're in, what they will do, <clears throat> and we can measure that against what we intended them to do. Uh, so let me just check in and see if that makes sense. So anyone uh, that wants to say something, you can unmute yourself and respond to Greg. He wants to know if you if that makes sense what he said. If you're if you're tracking, if you're following. So <laughs> it's a, quiet this, is a group. Cult, this is a cultural thing, I think. <laughs> and, and, and a quiet, quiet group. Yeah. So uh, I guess we can proceed and then. Uh, um, sure. Um, please feel free to jump in. If you are not following what I'm saying, stop and ask a question. It's important. Uh, uh, we're we're going to proceed in stages and each stage is going to follow on from the next stage. And so if there's a point where you don't follow, for example, when I say the Lambda calculus, um, how many people in the class know what the Lambda calculus is? It's really important that you answer this question. Good. All right. That's that's very good. We've got one answer. Probably um, most of the other students share that answer with you. So the Lambda calculus was developed um, by um, Alonzo Church uh, and Haskell B. Curry and a few others who are um, sort of the, uh, the originators of notions of computing. It's a very, very small um, calculus. Uh, uh, it has very simple syntax and very simple rules. Um, and it captures um, essentially what we mean by um, variable substitution. And it turns out that lambda calculus is one of the simplest models of computation. Um, and uh, as I said before, languages like Lisp and Clojure and Scala and F Sharp uh, and many, many others are based on the Lambda calculus. In fact, in general, a language is a functional language. So you may have heard the term functional language. What makes a language functional? It's functional if it's, uh, if at the core of the language, you find the semantics of the Lambda calculus. So what do I mean by semantics? So by semantics, I mean, um, I, there, there are typically three branches of semantics. 
So semantics are, are, is a way of analyzing computer programs. Um, and we give computer programs meaning, right? And there are essentially three ways that are traditionally um, understood to um, analyze our programs from a semantic perspective. One is denotational semantics. So to every program, we associate a mathematical object. And then <clears throat> the extent to which we can analyze these mathematical objects uh, is the extent to which we can analyze our programs. Another, um, another form of semantics is what's called metacircular semantics. So, uh, for example, uh, famously, the semantics of small talk was given in terms of an interpreter for small talk written in small talk. So this is a very um, esoteric <laughs> approach to semantics and not many people use it anymore, um, but it is still one that is recognized as a, a valid way of providing semantics. Um, and I mention it because there's a close connection to languages with reflection. Um, and then there's operational semantics. And operational semantics is what we'll be focusing on in this discussion. Operational semantics um, basically views uh, computation as a kind of um, a system of rules. Um, typically, these rules are a form of rewrite. Um, by rewrite, we mean you have some syntactical expression and it rewrites to another syntactical expression. And computation proceeds by iterating the rewrite rules over and over and over again until you reach a point where um, either the program diverges, which means the rewrite will continue forever, or the, you can't do any rewrites anymore. Uh, so there are no rules that apply. So uh, the, the rewriting has terminated. So if you want to um just paste in the chat whether or not that makes sense to you so Greg, when you say that, when you say that something reaches a point where it cannot rewrite anymore uh, what does that mean? That the state has um, reached a point where um, essentially None of the rewrite rules apply. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so since no one has seen the lambda calculus before, or at least one person has acknowledged that they haven't seen the lambda calculus before, let me just quickly sketch out the lambda calculus before we go into something a little bit more complicated like the row calculus. So um, the first piece of the syntax um, is, is uh, the first piece of the operational semantics is the syntax. And this is the free syntax. And I really need to know, it really is important that you answer, how many people are familiar with BNF grammars? How many people have seen at least seen or can uh, know how to read BNF grammars. Okay, all right. So um, a BNF grammar uh, is typically written in this form. You have uh, what are called non-terminal symbols on the left-hand left -hand side, and you have um, non-terminal or terminal terminal symbols on the right hand side. So these are rules. So BNF grammar, you can think of it like a data type constructor. Um, so you have uh, rules that are of the form, um, you know, such and such, the left hand side, and, and you can read the symbol as of the form. So M uh, or N are of the form, and then you can give the different kinds of forms they are. So in the, in the case of um, the lambda calculus, 
a lambda expression. So M and N stand in for lambda expressions and they're either variable mentions. So we'll have X range over variables um, or they are lambda abstractions. So we'll write this uh, this way, lambda X dot M or they are um, uh, applications. So the application of some expression M to an expression N. That's it. That's all the syntax of the lambda calculus. Now, <clears throat> if you were to try to feed such a data, so this looks almost exactly like the kind of data type declaration you see in a language like Haskell. Um, now, ha the Haskell um, compiler would be very upset unless you were to say exactly what X is. So it can see that M uh, also occurs over here. Um, so it's not worried about the M's or the N's, but it is worried about the X's. Here, we're just going to assume that we have some notion of variable. Um, but this assumption is uh, something that is broken in some sense in most specifications of the Lambda calculus. Typically, if you write, if you code up um, a, a representation of the Lambda calculus, then you would, you would have to pick a specific data type here. Alternatively, um, you could make these parametric in X. Uh, in which case, um, so for example, if you were treating this like a Scala declaration, um, then um, you would have M and uh, M be uh, uh, a trait um, that is parametric in um, a type X. Uh, and then you would have a um, case class which is uh, called variable mention, which is parametric in X and um, has exactly one field, uh, which is of type X. And then an abstraction, if you were doing this in Scala, would be a, um, a case class that had two fields, one of which, uh, and, and again, that case class is parametric in the type X, the fields would be um, the formal argument, uh, which would be of type X, and the body, which would be of type um, M. And again, M is this trait, lambda expression. And then finally, you would have a case class, again, parametric in X. And we need that parameter because we're going to refer to, uh, we're going to um, have two fields, the, the function field and the argument field, right? And uh, those are both lambda expressions, which are of course parametric in X. So we would have to supply that. So that's one way to interpret such a grammatical object, such a, a grammatical specification. Um, since most of you have never seen it, I'll give some examples of legal expressions uh, or expressions that would be recognized by this grammar. So expressions include just X, right? The grammar says an X is, a, is an M or an N. Um, and the comparison to whether or not the, re the, um, the uh, a grammar recognizes an expression or says that ex an expression is legal is exactly in correspondence with checking to see whether um, a term is of a given type. So we can say that X is of type lambda expression and that would be reasonable. Um, we can also, here's another one, lambda X dot X, right? Since after the X we can have, uh, after the lambda X dot something, we can have anything that is an M. Well, X's are M's. So that's a perfectly valid one. 
and here's another one, lambda x, oops, sorry, x dot x applied to lambda x dot x. So those are all um, valid expressions in the sense that they are legal according to this grammar or the um, automata that's associated with this grammar would recognize these expressions. Does any of that make sense? And please be honest. You just, uh, just uh, you know, state if you're following along. Yeah, please, please answer if you're following along or not with a yes or no. That's good. That's that's good. That's a that's a that's a good answer. Um, it is a, a a way to create some t syntax, and I get. But there's it's more that um, that's the general picture. the The specific picture is that we got uh, that we have a specific grammar, um, the grammar for the lambda calculus, uh, which allows us to um, write down uh, very very primitive or simple programs. Now it turns out that this um, syntax is sufficient to write down all programs that are uh, within the realm of Turing complete. So how many people here know what Turing complete is? Please answer if you know what Turing complete means. You might want to cover that, Greg. I don't think there is uh, um, a deep understanding of that. OK. So there are many models of computation. The lambda calculus is one. The von Neumann um, machines are another. Um, Turing, Alan Turing, an English uh, mathematician uh, uh, from uh, the uh, around the same time as Alonzo Church and Haskell Curry um, developed another model of computation. Um, this is typically used uh, in analysis of um, complexity. Um, so the, the model um, became rather famous because it was one of the few models where people could analyze computation in terms of how much um, space was required, how much memory you had to use, uh, and how, how much time was required in the computation. Um, so that's, that's one of its, its uh, claim to fame. It, it, uh, has, it gives rise to a notion, a very primitive notion of complexity. Um, in fact, in general, there are many models of computation um, and, um, uh, and we can analyze them in terms of some basic properties, such as whether they can, they can give us information about complexity. Another one is whether or not they are compositional. In other words, can we assemble um, new computations, more complex computations from, from less complex computations? So the lambda calculus, for example, is very good at that. You, it was already evident in the grammar. I assembled programs um, from other programs. With Turing machines, it is not compositional. Uh, you have to have a uh, you have to sort of build up things from scratch every single time. Um, uh, and then there is um, whether or not the programming model directly handles uh, concurrency. So can it, can it model uh, computations that happen autonomously at the same time? And then there is the question of completeness. Can we write down all the programs um, within this sort of the same expressiveness class? Uh, so Turing complete represents a, a high watermark in terms of expressiveness. Um, so it turns out that 
all of the models that are used for modern programming languages with the exception of quantum computing. So I won't get into quantum computing here. Uh, all of those models are what are known as Turing complete. Uh, and what that means, for example, the Lambda calculus is Turing complete. That means you can code up any computation expressed as a Turing machine in the Lambda calculus and vice versa. You can code up any um, computation expressed as a lambda expression in a Turing machine. So Turing, Turing complete is a, is a kind of measure of expressiveness of programs. Does that make sense? It's important to, to know whether or not the, this information is, is, a, is a landing. <laughs> So, um, Greg, I guess when we say um, it's a measure of expressiveness and we say Turing complete, I mean, it sounds as though there is a specific degree of expressiveness that's ensured or that is guaranteed if you're Turing complete, right? So what, yeah. what is that? How do you define that um, degree of expressiveness that must be met? That's such a great question. Um, unfortunately... Uh, the answer is only with respect to Turing machines um, or anything that's also in the same class. So there isn't an abstract property that's only the, that uses only the elements of the model to measure this kind of, um, this kind of expressiveness. So when you say something is Turing complete, it means that you can give a full and faithful encoding of Turing machines into your model of computation. Um, that's it. That's all it means. Uh, and, and so there is the famous um, hypothesis. So it's a conjecture. And the reason no one ever proved it, it was only done by, uh, by checking to see specific instances, is because no one formulated um, and the, the property in the abstract. Now, um, I submit that it is possible to formulate the property in the abstract in terms of self-encoding. So if your model of computation is um, clever enough, a subtle enough to give a full and faithful representation of itself, into itself, um, then you have uh, then you have Turing completeness. Uh, so there's, there there would be a lot to unpack there, but let's look at some models that are not Turing complete that are less expressive. So regular expressions are not Turing complete. Uh, as an example of what they cannot do that Turing machines can do. Regular expressions can't check for balanced parentheses. So if you want to do um, balancing of parens, like, you, you, you know, you have, uh, whenever you have an open paren, you have a corresponding um, closed paren in expressions that have nested uh, uh, parentheses. Um, regular expressions can't check that. Um, now, it turns out that um, there is a expressiveness class between regular expressions and um, a Turing complete context-free grammars. And the one trick that context-free grammars can do that regular expressions cannot do is um, balance parens. So, so that's a that's a that's a clear improvement in expressiveness, right? So, context-free grammars can check uh, whether or not an expression uh, with nested parentheses has uh, has balanced parentheses. Um, now, it turns out that there are computations that you can do um, with Turing machines that you can't do with context-free grammars. Um, so I would, I would urge, I would urge the, the folks here to take a look at context-free grammars and Turing machines and Google, um, what is it uh, that, 
that Turing machines can do that context-free grammars can't do. Um, and uh, that would be that that would be eye-opening in the sense of that you would you would learn the the extra delta in, in terms of expressiveness. But there's an open research problem, right? Which is, can you find a property that is expressed only of the model of computation that if you were to have this property then uh, you would um, be guaranteed to be at least Turing complete. So that's a, that's a very interesting idea. What it would mean though is that you would have to give um, an independent notion of model of computation. You'd have to say what a model of computation is. And that's that, the slipperiness of that idea is part of the reason why uh, the notion of Turing completeness is always measured with respect to the Turing machine yardstick or, or using a yardstick from any other um, a model of computation that is in that class of models. So that's a, th those are very subtle ideas. Does that make sense to you, Ralph? Yeah, it does. Cool. So to me, these are exciting and interesting ideas. And the reason they're exciting and interesting is because they show us how little we actually know about computation. We, we, we think we understand what computer programs are, but in any direction that we turn, it turns out that there are lots and lots of open questions. And this is what uh, to me is very exciting about uh, computation is that it's, while while you know um, computation has clearly changed our world, right? Imagine life without the internet, right? Imagine life without mobile phones or without laptops, right? That that that's that's a very different world. <laughs> um, so computation has clearly changed our world, um, but in any direction that we turn, if we give it just a little bit of scrutiny we don't know what computer programs are or what they do. <laughs> and that's very interesting, right? <clears throat> so we're, we're letting loose on the world something we really don't understand. <laughs> so part of this discussion is trying to make sure that we understand as much as we can. So let's turn back to the Lambda calculus uh, uh, example so we can move on because uh, we, we're, we're quite some time into this and um, just finish up the example. So we've, we've given some examples of the lambda calculus which I'll put out here. Now there's another piece of the puzzle which has to do with free and bound names. So essentially um, we call X's names Right, so really they're variables, but we also call them names. Uh, so you, you can call uh, free and bound variables. Uh, um, um, there's a subtle point, which is it's not the variable itself, it's a mention of the variable. There's a, in the same way that there's a difference between Alice and Alice's name, which is Alice. <laughs> there's a difference between a variable and a mention of, of a variable. Um, uh, another way of thinking about it is if you understand what a pointer is, there's a difference between uh, a pointer and the value. Um, so these are really mentions of variables, not, uh, not actual variables. Um, and we'll see that, uh, we can see that, um, for example, in the lambda expression, x applied to x. Uh, if it were the actual value, if it were the actual variable x, uh, then we'd have x occurring in two places at once. And we typically don't like that to happen uh, <clears throat> for lots and lots of uh, uh, physical systems. So uh, instead, they are their mentions or references uh, of the variable x. Um, now the reason the reason we need to um, talk about uh, bound versus free is because when a variable is bound, we can substitute um, uh, for it in an expression. So let's say I have the uh, lambda expression uh, 
lambda x apply uh, lambda x dot x, but now let's apply it to another variable. So, so let's suppose I apply this to y. So some variable y, or or even let's let's make it slightly more abstract. Let's apply it to some uh, lambda expression m. Um, so we don't know what m is, but the there's a rule which we'll see in just a moment, um, where whenever I apply a lambda expression, so if I think of this like a function, right? So like a function in Scala or a function in Python or a function in JavaScript, the application of the function is going to result in substituting in the body, the expression, um, m everywhere that x occurs. So if we were going to do that for this expression, um, so this is the, the formal argument to the function, and this is the expression where the argument might occur. In this case, the expression is literally just um, the, the, the formal argument. Um, and so if I were to substitute m for x in this, I would just get back m. That should be clear. I hope everyone is following along. Um, so uh, this is uh, an instance of a rule called beta reduction, which is the rewrite rule for the lambda calculus. Um, so that's, that's the heart of computation in lambda calculus, but it depends upon this notion of, of uh, free versus bound variables. So essentially a variable is bound if it occurs in a lambda expression, um, it's free if if it is not uh, in uh, covered by set the scope of a lambda expression like this. Um, so if we were to calculate recursively the free names, so I'll just write Fn for free names of lambda expressions, well, the free names of X is just the set containing X. And the free names of lambda x dot x, uh, sorry, lambda x dot m is recursively the free names of m, right? So we've, we've descended and then we're going to take away um, the, the x because x is not free in this expression. It's bound by the lambda. In other words, it's this, it's a, uh, used for substitution. And then finally, we have the free names of M applied. So expression has per parentheses in it. So that's going to be the free names of M union, the free names of N. So I've given a complete recursive specification of the notion of free names in, a, in an expression generated by this grammar. And then we can say that if um, a name occurs in M, in a lambda expression, and it does not occur freely, then it is bound. So that's the notion of free and bound. And the reason I need that is because I want to introduce a notion of equivalence. So this syntax is too fine-grained. It produces expressions which we want to treat, it, uh, it produces expressions which are different, which we want to treat as semantically the same. So in particular, we want to say that lambda x dot m is equal in some sense to lambda y dot m, but it's not just m, it's m where I have gone through and replaced, put y in for x. So that's what that, that ex syntax or notation means. Everywhere in M, provided that, um, that uh, y is fresh. So, um, or doesn't occur in uh, um, bound in M. So by fresh, we mean that it's just simply not utilized in M at all. 
So what the one way to understand this is if you're writing a JavaScript program or a Python program and you use the variable x as an argument in your function, it's the same function if you every if you consistently everywhere you used x you used y instead assuming that y doesn't collide with some other function arguments. That's really what this sentence is saying. Okay, so this notion is called alpha equivalence. So let me go and grab text and All right, so This is alpha equivalence. And now we need one other, uh, one other piece of the puzzle, and that's beta reduction. And this is the rewrite rule. All right, so the rule is that lambda x dot m so now notice that it's not lambda x dot x, but lambda x dot m, so we, we don't know what the body is, is going to reduce. So in a single step, we're gonna, uh, sorry. An application of lambda x dot m applied to some expression n is going to reduce in a single step to the expression m in which um, uh, uh, n replaces x everywhere uniformly. So this is an example, right? Now m here is playing in the role of n, x is playing in the role of m, and so if everywhere in the expression x I put m for x, I would get m. And that's exactly what this rule is all about. And this rule There we go. Shouldn't do that little bug in the program. This rule is called beta reduction. Somehow I grabbed. Okay, so these, this is the entire specification for the lambda calculus. So if you look up um, the theory behind all the functional languages, but also behind Python and Java and um, many other modern languages, you will find that the lambda calculus is at the heart of its semantics. So this is, um, this understanding this means you understand the core of all those languages. And that's, that's why it's important. That's another reason why it's important. If you walk around with this tiny little thing in your head, then whether you're approaching Scala or Haskell or um, Clojure or Dylan or um, OCaml, or, you know, the list goes on and on and on, you understand the core of those languages. So this is massive compression. It allows you to have uh, a, a, an understanding of a wide variety of languages, right? And it means you can kind of eat functional programming languages for breakfast because you look at how they express this core model and then any variations or differences that they might have, expansions, refinements of this model. So let me stop here and check and see if people are following. It's really important that you speak up. <laughs> this will help a lot. It will help you in your learning of computer science it will help you in um, practical job situations. Um, so I really need to know if you're tracking. 
so go ahead please type in chat in the chat um what um where you are meaning whether you are following somewhat following um yeah if there's a point of confusion if you have any questions all of that is important and there are there are no stupid questions it's okay to make mistakes it's okay to ask questions that you know it turns out that sometimes um okay it says it is somewhat tough to uh, to understand or yeah i'm assuming that you don't that this is a spelling mistake it is somewhat tough to understand okay good good that that that's that's a it's it's important to be honest um do you understand the grammar do you understand the kinds of expressions the grammar can generate and you can turn on your mic rather than talk if you're in a place where you can turn on your mic sir i'm going to make any difference to ensure i can't understand uh, as so you're coming through very low in volume hello sir yeah yeah very, yeah very now, good now you're a little better yes a mechanical right. student sir so i can't understand as is like so yes see but i am understanding that you're creating a syntax and how the inner core of the syntax um yeah so so that that, that that's very that, that's good that that's a, that's a beginning it's something i can i can work with okay so this little rule here describes a syntax here are some expressions that these first three are all expressions that are captured by this syntax can you give me another expression yeah you can you can type in the chat um another example uh expression that can yeah that would be that would be um recognized by this grammar and that's so, that applies to everyone on there not just on you um think about there are three examples there of what would follow that grammar can you um come up with a fourth one that follows the grammar so in case it's difficult when i write x here i mean i'm going to let this range over x y z a b c d whatever anything that is uh think of it as an identifier in python or an identifier in um scala or an identifier in javascript so so anything like that so y would be a legal expression according to this grammar so you have one example in the chat um ah uh, uh, so that's not an example and and why do we know that that's not an example the reason we know is because and we can just check it immediately right the this is um does equal show up here is there any use of an equal sign in uh in any of these alternatives there isn't so if if we as you know compilers so or interpreters so as interpreters we just would scan along and checking to see um the tokens of your expression well you know the slash is a token the x is a token the dot is a token um n um is a non terminal so you not likely to get away with that but more importantly the next one um is equals and equals is not even a token in the grammar so it's not a legal expression uh likewise the uh the substitution notation is not a legal expression in the grammar it's used outside of the grammar it's a it's a sort of a meta it's at the meta level so um if you think about um our objects of computation are expressions in the lambda calculus which are captured by the grammar and that are the any manipulations that we do on those objects are at the meta level they're 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 above um the in some sense the objects they're operating on those objects but the operations themselves are not a part of those uh those objects 
So that's uh, that's uh, uh, that distinction of meta level versus object level is very common in computer science. It's something that that is useful to understand, um, and um, and and there we don't want to confuse the symbols used at the meta level with the symbols used at the object level. Uh, so that good try though, good try. So how about I give a few more examples just for fun? So Y is an example of a variable. Z is an example of a variable. So those are all, since they're variables, they're all legal according to the grammar. Okay, so Y is an example of a variable. Since it's a variable, uh, it's a legal expression. Z is a legal expression. These are all legal expressions. Now, once I have um, a legal expression, I can always recombine it. So here's another example of a legal expression, lambda x dot y. Um, here's another one, lambda y dot x. Um, here's another one, lambda x dot lambda uh, sorry, lambda y dot apply x, sorry, I need the parens, apply x to y. These are all um, examples of um, lambda terms. Does that make sense? Uh, are you missing a dot in that uh, example, Greg? Did you mean to put a dot or not? I'm not missing a dot, no. So in that case, I didn't, uh, okay, let me see what you were trying to do there. So, oh, that's good. That's, that's useful. All right, so let's, let's take a look. So is this one legal? Yes, because that's that, mm -hmm. right? So now is this one legal from here to here? Yes. Yes, it is. And therefore, since that's legal, we know that lambda x dot some expression is also legal. So this oh, is. Oh, but that's what I'm saying. After your lambda x, there is no dot. That's the one I was thinking you're missing. I've got a dot here, right there. I just selected it. Oh, I don't see it. Okay, interesting. Uh, um, I see it. Really? Lambda dot. Yeah, lambda dot. No, lambda, lambda x. La after lambda x. Or lambda x. Dot? Oh. Yeah, after lambda x. Okay, now I dot, think I... then lambda y dot. Got it. Okay. All right. That was the one I was thinking was missing. For some reason, it's uh, super light on my screen. Maybe just how the light is falling on my screen, perhaps. Yeah. yeah. No, no, no worries. No worries. Yeah. But that's good. That's good. That kind of discussion is good because people can now see, you know, you know how you might go and check to see whether an expression is legal. All right. So he here's an interesting one, you know. For, for people who are interested in programming, is X plus Y legal? It's not. Right? There's no mention of the symbol X in this. And since there's no mention of the symbol X, um, that means that uh, uh, you can't write down something like this. And yet, I claimed that you could write down all computation, right? Anything you can do in Java or Haskell or Python or C or C Sharp or, or uh, C++, any computation you can represent via those programming languages, you can represent with this tiny little programming language. But if I can't even write down addition, how could I do that? Isn't that interesting? So it turns out that you can represent all data types, but in especially numbers and characters using the Lambda calculus. I'm not going to go into that uh, because uh, we're already an hour and four minutes in uh, and I want to move on to the row calculus, um, but uh, there are things called church numerals. So I'll write that down in uh, sort of a reference. So a few things for you folks to look up.
So some things that we talked about were Turing machines, and we talked about regular expressions, and we talked about context-free grammars. Um, so these are all models of computation. We talked about Turing completeness. And um, uh, another thing that I just mentioned is uh, church numerals. So church numerals are a way of expressing the counting numbers in the lambda calculus. And that's uh, because we can represent arithmetic directly in the lambda calculus is one of the reasons why we uh, can do, um, we, we know we can do all of, uh, all of computation, at least the kind of computation that is Turing complete. Uh, so those are, uh, those are, these are some legal examples. This is an illegal example. The example you gave in the chat was illegal. Do you understand why it was illegal? And why it's not a Lambda expression? I, did, I didn't understand. The, the question was, do you understand why the expression you typed is not, doesn't belong in that grammar or doesn't satisfy that grammar? Because Greg went, went through and explained um, the reasons why it wouldn't, wouldn't be part of that grammar. Did, did you understand that? As his explanation. I explained that uh, I I got I understand what sir said, but I not understand why this is illegal. Okay, so let's let's go over that explanation again. It's very it's very useful. Um, so, do you see the symbol equal that you wrote? Yes, sir. Okay, yes, sir. great. So now, does that does the equal symbol occur anywhere in here? No, sir. Okay, that's why. It's the same reason I gave why I can't write down x plus y, because plus doesn't occur anywhere in here. It's only the dots and the lambda only. Only these things. These are the only things we're allowed to use. This expression here is um, is uh, a, an equivalence class that we're imposing on these things. So we can generate, this will generate an infinite number of expressions, right? We can, we can see that this will generate an infinite number of expressions, um, right? Uh, Greg, this, you lost sharing it. The, oh, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, okay. All right. So we can see that this generation, uh, this expression will generate an infinite number of expressions. This thing here is not in the grammar. It's something above or outside of the grammar. And what it does is it says there are certain expressions that we're gonna treat as the same. So when you have an expression like this, we're gonna treat it as the same, that's what the equal sign means, as an expression like this. So, so we can now give examples um, of this. So let's give some examples. So um, lambda x dot x, we're going to treat as the same as lambda y dot y. The, and the reason they're the same um, should, should be very clear. If I apply lambda x dot x to some expression m, I don't know what that expression is, um, that reduces to um, m, right? So in one step, it goes to x where I apply the substitution m for x, and that is the same as m. So now let's run the same program for y. Sorry. Okay, so in a single step, that goes to y where I apply the substitution m for y. And that's the same as 
him. So in all situations, um, this thing is going to behave the same as this thing. So there's no way to distinguish them. So I really want to treat them as the same. So alpha equivalence uh, sort of recognizes our intuitions about what, uh, what programs are the same. So this is, this is what, so alpha equivalence is a rule on top of this set of programs. So this is generating uh, program expressions, right? The syntax, but we don't yet know how to run the programs. This tells us how to run the programs. Whenever I have something like this, I turn it into something like this. So I rewrite program text that looks like this, and I turn it into program text that looks like this. And, um, and if I do that, I want, ultimately I want to treat all programs that look like this as the same, to be the same as programs that look like this. So for example, programs that look like this to, should be the same as programs that look like this. And it works for all the variables. So lambda z dot z, uh, but it's not just, you know, the identity program, you know, it's, you know, lambda x dot lambda y dot apply x to y, right? That's going to be the same as lambda z dot lambda y, oops, I hit a comma, dot lambda y dot apply z to y. Same program, because everywhere I have an X, I've changed it to a Z. So that's what, that's what alpha equivalence does, right? And alpha equivalence is on the outside of uh, this, this uh, grammar. It's, a, it's something that we impose upon this structure, which we generate freely. And then this is a rewrite rule. Now, in general, if you want to give the semantics of a programming language, any programming language, you give three things. You give the syntax, you give the equivalences. Sometimes the syntax generates syntactical distinctions, which are finer they, they, they make our eyes think that the programs are different when in fact the programs are not different, right? So we erase those differences with some equivalence rules. And then, um, and then we give some rewrite rules and those rewrite rules are typically not on the programs themselves, but on the equivalence classes generated by the, uh, by the, uh, the equivalence the, the structural equivalence or the, the syntactic equivalence. I know that's a lot to a lot to take in, um, but just think about this. It's it's working on programs as opposed to program text. So programs are are the things that you get after you've erased all um, syntactic differences that don't make a difference. Okay, so I'm now going to. Uh, go to uh, the row calculus, which is in many ways inspired by the lambda calculus. So it turns out that you can prove, there's a theorem called Berry's theorem, that all lambda programs compute sequentially. One step and then another step and then another step, and then another step. So there is no concurrency. There are no threads in the lambda calculus. And you can prove this mathematically. That's another reason why it's important to understand these kinds of core models. When someone presents you with Haskell, uh, and you can say, is Haskell concurrent? 
Well, you can say, well, without some additions to the lambda calculus, no, it's not concurrent. So for example, if you, if you were to conclude that the only way to make something scale, like a blockchain scale, you would have to add concurrency. Then if someone said that the core smart contracting model was based on the Lambda calculus, it was some language, I don't know, say solidity, that was based on the Lambda calculus then you could immediately go, oh, well, I know that the lambda calculus is sequential. And therefore, this smart contracting language cannot be concurrent. And so that blockchain can't scale, right? I did that in 30 seconds. It took me 30 seconds to do that reasoning. I was watching the clock. Right, so that's another reason why understanding the, these basic concepts of computer science help you evaluate um, proposals. Right, so there are many, many blockchain proposals. Cardano, um, uh, trying to think, uh, what was the other one? Uh, well, obviously Ethereum, many, many others um, that have proposed smart contracting languages that are provably sequential. And so their ability to scale is non-existent. <laughs> and so you can just check at a glance, will this thing scale? Well, you just look and see, well, is the smart contracting language uh, um, amenable to or support, does it support concurrency? And if it doesn't, then you go, oh, well, this isn't going to scale and you can move on very quickly, right? So that's a, another example of a practical application of some of the theory. Now, it is important to understand that the Lambda calculus uh, is still at the heart of the operational semantics of all these modern languages. And so uh, many people wanted a similar kind of calculus, but, for, but that allowed to capture notions of concurrency. Uh, so concurrent execution where two computations can proceed um, independently, autonomously, but occasionally communicate with each other. Right, so they synchronize at moments of communication. Uh, so Robin Milner, who won the Turing Award, um, uh, when he invented a calculus called the Pi calculus, uh, that was his goal. So he was he was solving a kind of uh, a kind of higher level equation that looked something like this. So lambda. So, and by lambda, I mean the lambda calculus. So lambda is to sequential programming as, so we write that as with a double colon, uh, x, so we don't know what x is, is to concurrent programming. If you don't mind, I'll just put this on a second line. All right, so this is like an SAT question. Lambda is to, is to sequential as X is to concurrent programming, solve for X. So that was, that was Milner's goal with the pi calculus. And the pi calculus was a solution to that, uh, to that uh, little puzzle that Robin set for himself. Now, in the same way that I pointed out that the lambda calculus depends upon this notion of variable or identifier, the pi calculus depends upon a notion of variable or identifier. And that is, um, uh, uh, it's problematic. 
And the reason it's problematic is because, uh, well, it's, it's a subtle reason, so I won't go too deep into it, but it, it ends up being a way you can sneak another model of computation into your model. Uh, in the Lambda calculus, it's not uh, a problem uh, for a, a range of reasons, largely that has to do with the, 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 the way in which the Lambda calculus uses variables. Um, but uh, for, uh, uh, for the Pi calculus, it is, um, it is a fatal problem in the sense that it prevents the Pi calculus from being a fundamental model of computing. Uh, Instead, however, um, uh, we can fix that. And so that's what I'm going to do now is to fix that little issue. So here, um, because we're dealing with concurrent computations, they're not functions. So functions take in arguments and produce results. So that's the essence of the lambda calculus. Take in arguments, produce results, right? So that's the that's the the idea. And then here is the application of a function to its argument. Processes don't do that. Processes um, are not like functions. So a one way to understand that is to ask yourself, what value does the internet compute? It doesn't compute a value, right? It's more about interaction. The internet is really about, you know, uh, allowing people to, uh, to connect and interact with people or people to connect and interact with programs uh, or artificial intelligence. Uh, any, any of those kinds of interactions is what the internet is about, right? So, so there's a different notion of computation at work already in the internet. Right. And so, um, uh, so we're shifting from a notion of program to a notion of process. So I'll use, instead of using M and N, I'll use P and Q. And um, there's a small syntactic collision that we'll have to go over in just a second. But we start with the stopped process. So this is the process that doesn't do anything. It's completely inert. It doesn't interact. That's the ground of our notion of computing. The, the zero is the stopped process. It just, it just sits there, doesn't do anything. Now, um, in contrast, we can think about like a function, but not the same as a function, a process that waits for a value which we'll call y. So that's just like the lambda, uh, the lambda y dot some expression. That y is a bound variable. So it's it's the variable we're going to get. And where are we going to get that variable from? We're going to get it from uh, a channel. So we're gonna, this process is going to listen on a channel, call it x. Whatever comes out of that channel, we're gonna bind it to the variable y inside the process p, and then start running p with that binding of the value for y. So if we can listen on channels, we can also send on channels. But what can we send? Well, we're only going to allow to send processes. And now if, they're sending and receiving, well, how would they ever connect with each other? Well, they'll connect with each other because we can put them in parallel. We can run them in parallel. Um, so normally we use pipe to denote parallel, uh, running two processes in parallel. And so I want to distinguish that pipe from this pipe here. So let's see if I can make that um, bold. Um, and make it a little bigger. So we don't confuse the, uh, we don't confuse the, 
these these different pipes. So I'll just go ahead and put so P in parallel with Q, and I'll make this one bold. And make it a little bigger. Um, and then finally, um, I guess these, I should make them a little bigger. Okay, there we go. And then finally, we have um, Oops. Oh, what happened? It got rid of my, oh, all right. Well, I'll, I'll clean that up then. Zero or four Y, Y from X, P or send on X Q or um, run P in parallel with Q or um, uh, turn an X into a process. Now, how would I be able to turn an X into a process? Um, well, that's because uh, we get our X's and our Y's Stop it. <laughs> Don't do it. Um, from uh, quoting processes. So a process is now a, a, a name is a quoted process, or you can think of it as the code of a process. Right? So we know in JavaScript what it means to send some JavaScript from one place to another and start running that JavaScript. So this is packaging up the code, like the JavaScript, uh, into a message. That's, that's what this at sign is. And then um, if I have, uh, so all the X's and Y's are of this form. If I have an X, which is really the code of a process, I can start running it. So the star says start running it. And this syntax is reminiscent of C. This is get a pointer, and this is dereference that pointer. So now um, the equivalences that we impose on these processes um, are to, uh, uh, that we, we want to include alpha equivalence. Here's the notion of binding, right? So whenever we replace, uh, we consistently replace bound variables, we do not change the meaning of the program. So we're going to include alpha equivalents, but we're also going to include some other, um, some other rules. So the other rules are that zero is an identity for parallel composition. So what I mean by that is, suppose that I'm running some program and I run that in parallel with the stopped process, the process that does nothing. Well, that's gonna, we're gonna treat that the same as if um, uh, 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 we just are running the process. In addition, we also want that P par Q, uh, so if I run P and Q in parallel, it's the same as if I ran Q and P in parallel. And then finally, suppose that I, I'm running P in parallel with running Q in parallel with R. Right? Well, that's going to be the same as if I ran P in parallel with Q and Q in parallel, and, and that whole expression in parallel with R. So those are our, our rules for, we have alpha equivalence together with um, rules that make um, the set of all expressions uh, together with zero and parallel uh, into what's called a commutative monoid.
I won't won't go into that, but go look it up. So over here, now let me see. I think I, yeah, that's. Let me just double check that I. Yep, I just need to add this. All right. So now over here, I'm just gonna put some additional notes. So the notes are that um, you should look up what a monoid is and what a commutative monoid is. <laughs> okay. All right, so now we have um, the core rule. It's no longer called beta reduction. It's called the communication rule or the COM rule for short. All right, so what it says is suppose I have a process that's listening on X, sorry, listening for Y um, on X, and then it's going to become P. And that's running in parallel with a process that's sending Q on X. Then, just like the lambda calculus, um, a kind of substitution or rewrite is going to occur. And so what we're gonna, this turns into the process P in which all the instances of Y are replaced with the code of Q. So we send Q as a message, right? And we replace um, all the instances in uh, P, uh, instances of Y in P with the code for Q. That's it. That's the core rule. Now there are a couple of other rules um, that we need uh, to close up. It has to do with really what's called execution context. So suppose that P evolves to P prime using our, our rules. Then we want uh, to conclude uh, that P in parallel with Q evolves to P prime in parallel with Q prime. I start with Q. Um, so what that says, this says that parallel allows for communication, but it also doesn't sequentialize computation. So if P can make progress on its own, sorry, I didn't put the prime here. If P can make progress on its own, then P can make progress even if it's running in parallel with Q. It's not stuck waiting for Q. That's under the assumption that P can make progress on its own. And then we have one more rule. And this is where all that noise I was making about equivalence classes is really important. Because this says that it's really programs that execute, not syntax. So suppose that P is equal to P prime, equal in this sense of equal. It's either alpha equivalent or it's, you know, it's got a zero that we're getting rid of, or, you know, we flip around um, the par or we reassociate. All right, so suppose that, that P evaluate, uh, is this, is, uh, structurally equivalent to P prime. Suppose that P prime evolves, so it rewrites via our rules to Q prime. And suppose that Q prime is equivalent to, sorry, Q prime. Fingers. Uh, 
is equivalent to Q. Then we will conclude that P rewrites to Q. There, that's the row calculus. So if there, uh, so we're, we're, we're way past time. Um, and uh, a lot of that has to do with kind of impedance matching, right? We're sort of learning how to talk to each other and also, um, you know, sort of developing um, background to understand this. Um, go ahead, Brown. Sounds like you want to say something. Yeah, no, I was going to ask. Um, so it, it, it seemed like you jumped from uh, Lambda to uh, Rho. I thought you were going to stop somewhere in between to say this is Pi and then go to <laughs> go to the row. But no, I, the, reason, the reason I didn't do that is because pi is actually much more complicated than rho. Okay, I see. Yeah, I see. Rho, is, rho has many fewer moving parts. Um, and that's kind of its claim to fame. It is smaller than pi and does more than pi. Got it, okay. Yeah. So, so one of the things that's really interesting uh, so we, we, we remember we talked about this notion of expressiveness and we sort of said Turing complete is a, a high water mark of expressiveness. It turns out, however, that there are other aspects of expressiveness that are not captured by Turing complete. So in particular, Turing complete says nothing about sequential versus concurrent execution. It is completely blind to this aspect of expressiveness. Saying that a model is Turing complete does not tell you anything about its, um, whether, whether or not the model is sequential or concurrent. Likewise, um, saying something is Turing complete does not tell you anything about whether or not the model has uh, the ability to measure complexity. You cannot measure complexity in the lambda calculus, for example. There's an old joke that uh, uh, Lisp programmers know the value of everything because they can run beta reduction until they get a value, but they know the cost of nothing. Um, so it's like that phrase. <laughs> hey, Greg, can I, can I just postulate something? from what you just said so um and it's this this concurrency aspect so i remember having a conversation with robin years ago that you know, you could you could in terms of by simulation and what we call sometimes observable behavior so you can go into an airport lounge like right, posh airport lounge that has a really big coffee machine right and you buttons put a token in and out comes a latte Right. What you have no idea of, because the observable boundary you have, one doesn't express anything about concurrency. It's an it's a se sequential boundary mm. that if you could push down inside the machine, you may be able to see if you had the ability to write it down what was happening in parallel. So mm. inside the machine, you might have a really sophisticated, highly parallelized machine that generates a latte or you might have a very small person inside the machine that makes the latte mm -hmm. and what the only thing that you can observe is do i get the latte out or not and the only extra thing you can observe which doesn't give you the clue as to whether it's sequential or not is how long did it take yes right? now, 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 there's an important thing to notice however about your example um in order to simplify the interaction, most of those um, interfaces don't allow you to push multiple buttons at once. Yes. However, there are lots and lots of machines that do allow you to push multiple buttons at once. A good example would be a piano. Yes. Right, so, so it's not required <laughs> that the interface be sequential. It often is, but it's not a requirement. In fact, we could imagine a vending machine that did allow you to push multiple buttons at once. 
So for example, after it takes your money, you could, you could simultaneously select a packet of crisps and a chocolate bar. Yeah. But anyway, go on, go on. Yeah, so I mean, so that's kind of what I was p pointing out that if you just modeled it as, as a Turing machine, um, the only thing you get to observe is, you know, did it produce the coffee or, or did it not? Mm -hmm. Based on the interaction you have with it. And the only clue, the only clue you have as to whether it's doing something funky inside that you don't understand because you don't understand concurrency, you haven't written it down at this point, um, it is based upon the observable notion of how long did it take? Yep. Or how many resources observably did it use in some way, shape, or form? And exactly. what Pi gives you is the ability to describe the concurrency that might be inside and therefore allows you to change the observable boundary so that you can actually see some of that. Uh, that's right. That, but you that, don't have to. I mean, you can you can observe it as a Turing machine. That, that's exactly right. And this is and this was this was some this was the observation that I made when I was in the middle of Alan Emerson's class on theory of computation and bored out of my skull and going, well, hang on, hang on. How do I compare all these different models of computation? And that's when I came up with my four properties, right? So completeness, um, co uh, complexity, uh, compositionality, and uh, concurrency. So oh, those these are the same four properties that you listed on the day you came down to the choreography working group. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the slide. Exactly. Uh, and, and it turns out that they're, they're, they're a better measure of expressiveness. Um, and in fact, there are other measures of expressiveness. Um, so for example, re reflection. In having those models doesn't tell you whether or not a model is reflective. Um, but that, you know, in, in terms of our, 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 our friends here who want to um, participate in the hackathon, um, the, thing, the thing that's unique about the row calculus is this ability to convert back and forth between channels and processes. So Pi doesn't have that. Uh, Pi depends upon you providing a notion of channel. It doesn't say what a channel is. It just says, if you tell me what a channel is, I can build you a notion of processes that can communicate over those channels. Ro says, no, I'm gonna tell you exactly what a notion of a channel is. Um, and I'm going to relate that notion of what a channel is to um, uh, being able to package up a process as uh, a channel and then unpackage it, unpackage channels and turn them back into running processes. So that's the, that's the unique insight of the row calculus and that it gives you um, the ability to reflect Right, so you can turn programs into data and data back into programs. Um, if you are interested a, a little bit in the history of um, computer science, if you go back to the Lambda calculus, um, there are effectively two directions that research takes. So Robin Milner takes the Lambda calculus and he adds t uh, a typing discipline for the Lambda calculus and produces what's called ML. And there are a whole family of languages that come out of ML. So uh, out of ML, we get OCaml and F Sharp and Scala. So those three languages come from the, from the typing side of the Lambda calculus. Can I check my programs using types uh, for certain kinds of errors? The other side is the reflective side. So the Lisp programmers were totally into this idea that I could turn a list program into some data, an S expression, and turn an S expression back into a Lambda expression and therefore a program. So the reflective side was what the Lisp, so Lisp, Dylan, and a bunch of other languages, Brown, 3Lisp, a bunch of other languages all explored the reflective side. And it wasn't until the early 2000s that people could put the two together. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. so so that reflection that reflection idea is a subtle one, and getting reflection and typing to work together is an even more subtle one. Um, and putting reflection 
and concurrency together is even more subtle. <laughs> um, but it turns out if you do that, then you greatly simplify pi. Uh, and that's sort of where the, where the row calculus comes in. So anyway, so you, you've had a little bit of a taste of, uh, of the row calculus, the lambda calculus, and this way of thinking about uh, computation and computer programs. It's very different than, you know, nose dive into Python and copy some programs and, and try to make those programs do what you want. This gives you the ability to compress a lot of the information that you might have in a programming language down to a much smaller surface area. So Rolang comes from the row calculus. Even though there's more stuff in Rolang, it all boils down to what you can do with this calculus. So if you understand this calculus and notice how big it is, it fits on one page. <laughs> That's really important. So if you want to have some compression, if you don't want to clutter your mind with a lot of details, this is a way to shrink down a lot of the clutter and then you can expand it uh, to add additional syntactical uh, gadgets and gizmos. All right, that's all I'll talk about for today.